And we, we started our program in June of 1990, and I was coming from a, a clinical BPH research perspective. So it was, it was in terms of trying to prospectively accumulate data on how the patients were performing, it was easy to add the IPSS, urinary symptom scores, because I was doing, using that anyway for my BPH studies. But there were no tools or instruments to assess prospectively sexual function, so I had to make one up. And most of us urologists are pretty simple, so we made up a simple tool, which was the Mount Sinai Sexual Function Inventory, it was zero for no erection, one for erection, but not satis satisfactory for penetration, two, satisfactory for penetration, but suboptimal, and three, a normal erection, which basically mirrors what eventually happened with the Massachusetts scoring system, which was five points, or the SHIM score three, as Juanita just showed you. Uh, we added the SHIM score in uh, 2000, year 2000, 10 years later, so we have accumulated a lot of data on both, uh, but the SHIM data is less robust because it was added 10 years later. But we did do a study uh, we published in BJUI comparing the results of using the Mount Sinai and the SHIM score, and the concordance was above 80%. So we have a lot of confidence that uh, we can rely on one score or the other when we look at data. So the, our first publication was back in 2000 when we looked at 416 patients, so these would be with the Mount Sinai function score showing what the outcome of pres preservation of sexual function was in men receiving brachytherapy. Uh, and what we noticed immediately was uh, this is the entire population, so that includes men who had a score of one, zero or one, which was basically not, they weren't able to have intercourse, or, or if you just took the group who were potent prior to treatment, we saw at five years about 65 to 70 percent of the men did preserve a score of two or three. And then we, we broke it down and we said, well, what happens if you present with a three, which is normal, or two, which is you still can have penetration, but it's suboptimal. And then we saw this huge difference in sexual function preservation. So the pretreatment score uh, was clearly, at least very early on when we were looking at this data, the most important predictor of how a man was going to do in terms of preserving sexual function. The surgeons then adopted this methodology uh, several years later, and they report exactly the same data. We did see a little bit of a hit on, in terms of the dose. So if the patients with a higher dose tended to have a little bit less uh, preservation of sexual function, but that wasn't a really... Even though it was statistically significant, it wasn't that big of a clinical significant difference. And then uh, a couple of year, a few years later, now we're still using the, the uh, Mount Sinai sexual function. We did report that we saw a big difference in age. And when we published the uh, data 2013, looking at men below 60, we found that of the 89 men below 60 who had brachytherapy, preservation of sexual function was almost 70%, which was really good news. And this was with a SHIM score this time, not with a Mount Sinai score. So I've been presenting this data over the several years. And last year at the AUA, I presented our 10-year data. And during that session, I took a lot of heat because several of uh, my colleagues got up and said, well, your data, you know, it's hard to believe the Mount Sinai data, so Mount Sinai data is so good because You've got the group in Michigan reporting 20 points less. You've got Gregory Merrick's group in West Virginia reporting 10 to 20 points less. And you, here you guys at Mount Sinai are reporting much higher data. It wasn't the first time we heard that. So a number of years ago, uh, we decided we would go ahead and take a look at the dose to the neurovascular bundle and the penile bulb. Because the Mount Sinai implant, from, the day, from day one, when we started in 1990, when I designed it, it was all real-time based. So that meant the rest of the world that was doing implants was using a Seattle pre-plan methodology. And it was very hard, especially back then, when your, our ultrasound tools were very cruel, to pre-plan out an implant and be sure you weren't pulling seeds down below the apex and putting them near the penile bulb or into the neurovascular bundle. Plus, because of the uncertainty 
of knowing where the apex was, they tended to put a lot more activity in that area, general area. And as Dr. McLaughlin has showed you, you have to be precise when you're doing an implant. And with our technique, when we started, we were always watching in sagittal and using a MIG applicator so you could place the seeds individually. We were always aware of where the apex was, and we were very careful not to put seeds below the apex and get them into the UG diaphragm. So this is just a paper one of our residents, Amy Sloan, wrote showing the implant and nice peripheral loading. In fact, today, if the patient has a prostate volume, of less than 35 cc's, and we're using activity, let's say it's I9 of a 0.4 millicuries or so about, you almost never put a, pay, a seed inside the prostate. So we, when we first described our technique back in 1995, 96, after we had figured out where the seeds would go, we always often put seeds in the side of the prostate, and we have a two-phase technique, so you have the peripheral needles and then we implant the interior needles. But those interior needles, even though they look like they are designed to put seeds interior to the prostate, all the interior needles are doing is they're delivering radiations at the two ends. And so the interior needles are delivering seeds at the base, at the capsule, and at the apex at the capsule, or just inside the capsule. So we uh, did this study where we contoured out the penile bulb and the neurovascular bundles. And then we measured radiation doses uh, at the uh, D5, the D20, the D50, et cetera, all the typical things we would do. And basically, we found that the dose of radiation to those structures was very low. And the three-year three potency rates, when you look at patients based on the dose imagery to the neurovascular bundle or to the penile bulb, they also showed no differences in sexual function because basically there was very little radiation delivered to those structures. That's very different than uh, what they do at, uh, in uh, Virginia, which I'll show you at Gregory Mas uh, Merrick's thing. So as, this is one of Dr. McLaughlin's slide, slides. So you know, if you're lucky enough to have a patient that has a big distance between the apex of the prostate and the penile bulb and you put some seeds uh, down here, your patient's gonna be okay, but if you have a situation where the distance is very small and you're pulling seeds out of the apex and you are irradiating the penile bulb, you can bet you're gonna end up with sexual dysfunction. And this situation is going to be magnified and those patients have to have combination therapy because with combination therapy, if you're dealing with a patient like this and you've already got seeds down by the penile bulb and you've got very little distance for your external beam planning, you can bet that this area is gonna get a lot of radiation. And if we believe what Dr. Crook says, and I believe it, that we're starting to see more patients with high-risk features because of the, because we're not doing enough PSA testing, we have more patients who are gonna to have to have combination therapy, we really need to start thinking about this situation, especially if we wanna preserve sexual function in younger men. So this is, uh, the, uh, the uh, Merrick's group showing their results. So at seven years, they had 55.6% sexual preservation. Uh, the same thing as we have in terms of your pretreatment sexual function predicts for your post-treatment preservation, both in that and in age, which you see on the right. But the important thing here was they took a look at the radiation doses to the penile bulb, so the D95 through the D25, and then just about all of them were significant. Again, reiterating the point that you need to be careful when you put those apical seeds in, but you don't want to be so careful where you're not putting enough radiation at the apex and make that a weak spot. So it's, it's a technical issue, and the apex needs to be really well identified uh, when you're doing your procedure. Uh, we got involved uh, early on with the idea that maybe we could prophylax radiation damage to the neurovascular bundle if we gave the patients pretreatment PDE5 inhibitors. So we did a study with uh, Mike Zalewski at Memorial and hoping that, especially if our patients were, the theory was the patients, they're gonna get combination therapy and then you put them on hormones, they're not gonna have sexual function, we could increase the blood flow during a period of time, they're on hormones and not sexually active by giving them PDE5 inhibitors, but it did no good. So that study uh, didn't pan out. 
and there's results showing the placebo and the sildenafil groups um, in terms of time versus uh, EF scores and, uh, and then the subscores and then the total scores. So that didn't help.